Instead of perception depending mainly on signals coming into the brain from these sensory organs, it depends just as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. So these are the signals coming into so this would be the how things seem bottom up view, but from the prediction machine view, perception depends just as much, or probably more, on these predictions that flow from the top down or the inside out. So we don't just passively perceive our worlds, we actively generate them. Let me flesh out this picture just a little bit more to give you a sense of how predictive perception of this kind actually plays out in the circuits of the brain, or at least how we think it might play out. Here's, it's a pretty complicated diagram. I'm not gonna go into the details, just give you the big picture. And the three big gray boxes, we can imagine those as three cortical regions, let's say three stages of processing in the visual cortex, for instance. And the basic idea here is that the blue arrows, which are going in this sort of inside out, top down direction, these carry the predictions about sensory signals. While the red arrows, what we would normally think of the sensory information being conveyed into the brain from the world. Instead, these red arrows just carry the prediction arrows. The differences between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. And the bit in the middle, all those complicated black arrows, well, they're just the brain's way of minimizing prediction error at each level. And that's how perception works. Perception is implemented in this picture simply by the brain trying to minimize prediction errors everywhere and all the time so that it's calibrating its perceptual best guesses, its predictions against the world through just using prediction errors to figure out how on track its predictions are. So perception here isn't about reading out sensory information. It's this process of calibration of the brain's best guesses against an unknown and ultimately an unknowable world. And um, for those interested in, in more of the details, this process of prediction error minimization, what it amounts to is an approximation to a mathematical technique called Bayesian inference. And so what the brain is doing in this sense is approximate Bayesian inference on the causes of sensory signals. So the uh, predictive brain is also a Bayesian brain. Now, back into the, the sort of more familiar, one immediate implication of all this is that what we hear, what we see, what we smell are all deeply shaped by the brain's expectations, by its predictions. And we all know this in some way. Now, if you walk out on a misty morning and you're expecting to meet a friend on the corner, and you really see that person until you get closer and you realize you've been waving at a stranger. And but, you know, you, you really saw, uh, you thought you were seeing somebody else. So colloquially, we're all familiar with this kind of thing, but it holds up in the lab too. This is a simple study, just to give you an idea of the kind of work we can do or we used to be able to do in the lab to put all this on a firmer footing. Here we use a simple method called continuous flash suppression. What we do is we show an image of either a house or a face to one eye and a changing pattern of colored shapes to the other eye. And the contrast of the image gradually grows while the contrast of the colored shapes gradually fades. And the images are merged through a stereoscope so that when you look at the combined image, what you see initially are just the colored shapes. And then at some point, the image, the house or the face, breaks through into your conscious perception. What we did was we led people to expect to see either houses or faces, and we then measured how quickly uh, the suppressed image broke through into consciousness. And what we found over a number of studies is that we see faces more quickly and more accurately when that is what we're expecting to see. And the same goes for houses. So altogether, in these studies for sure, what we see, what we expect to see, not what violates our expectations. And that's just uh, some data to validate what I just said there, because um, it's true. And with that in mind, here's one takeaway already. Now, we're used to saying, I'll believe it when I see it. But perhaps we should be saying something else. Perhaps we should be saying, I'll see it when I believe it. Now, these beliefs or expectations, this is important, they're not typically or necessarily beliefs that we're conscious of having. They might be, but they might not be. But they're also beliefs that can operate at many different levels from implicit beliefs about shadows that are encoded into the circuitry of the visual cortex to implicit beliefs arising from our social, our cultural, and even our political environments. If you believe particular things, you will perceive particular things.
Now, this idea of predictive perception can also help us understand what happens in unusual situations when some people experience things that others don't, what we would typically call a hallucination. And the basic idea here is that hallucinations happen when people's perceptual predictions are too strong, overwhelming the sensory data so that we see what we expect to see even more so than normal. What we've done here is we've combined immersive virtual reality with image processing to simulate this process, to simulate the effects of unusually strong perceptual predictions on visual experience. In this panoramic video, which you'd normally watch through a head-mounted display, the world, which in this case is the campus of my University of Sussex, becomes a kind of psychedelic playground. What we've done is we've processed the footage using an algorithm based on Google's Deep Dream to simulate what would happen if the brain had very strong perceptual predictions to see dogs everywhere. And you can see this leads to some very strange effects. There are a few too many dogs here. And when perceptual predictions are too powerful, the result looks very much like the hallucinations people report in various altered states or even in psychosis. Let's think about this for a moment. If hallucinations are a kind of uncontrolled perception, well then normal perception right here and right now is also a kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are continually reined in by sensory signals coming from the world. In fact, you could say that we're hallucinating all the time. It's just that whenever we agree about our hallucinations, that's what we call reality. But I just want to be clear about one thing here, that I'm not saying things don't exist. Right? Things exist. Buses, cars, tables, chairs exist. It's not that everything is in the mind. What is constructed is how these things appear in your conscious experience. Um, and that's it's kind of an important distinction to make. If you go and stand in front of a bus, it will still hit you and that will not be good.